Congestive heart failure. One in every five Americans will develop heart failure. During your time in the hospital, this is a disease that you will see no matter where you work. Heart failure is classified into two main categories, systolic and diastolic heart failure. Diastolic heart failure is known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. In this video, we will be focusing on systolic heart failure. When examining systolic heart failure, about 70% are ischemic and 30% are non-ischemic. The word ischemic means inadequate blood supply, which results in inadequate oxygen supply, and therefore tissue death. Now let's look at the pathophysiology of systolic heart dysfunction. First you look at the normal functioning of the heart as it relates to cardiac output. Cardiac output means the amount of blood that is being pumped by the heart. In a normal heart, this reflects the normal cardiac output of the heart. When there is an ischemic injury, this is also known as myocardial infarction. The cardiac tissue will be weakened, which results in a decreased contractility of the myocardium, and therefore the cardiac output, or amount of blood being pumped by the heart, will be decreased. We can look closer at this by looking at the Frank-Starling's relationship, which shows us the relationship from stroke volume to preload. You usually see it in a graph like this. On the right, you'll see the word stroke volume, which represents the volume of blood pumped by the left ventricle per beat. Then on the bottom, you will see the word preload, which represents the initial stretching of the cardiac tissue prior to contraction. I like to think of preload as stretch and afterload as squeeze. This helps me remember. Preload is the end diastolic volume, which you may see abbreviated as EDV. Afterload is the pressure in the wall of the left ventricle during ejection. Cardiac output is the amount of blood volume ejected over a period of time. First, let's look at the chart, and then we will see a visual demonstration. Here you see a normal functioning heart. This heart has a normal preload and stroke volume. If the heart has injury, you will see something like this, a decrease in preload and stroke volume. In this visual demonstration of the heart, this part is demonstrating the preload and this is the stroke volume. You can see that the stroke volume of the heart increases in response to an increase in the volume of blood filling the heart, aka preload, which is also known as the end diastolic volume. For cardiac output, the other factor you need to know is the heart rate. Basically, the cardiac output is the stroke volume per heart rate. It looks like this. So think about it like this. Contractility is pumping, but the pump needs liquid to pump, which is volume. So whatever is pumped out is the output, also known as the afterload. This shows the stroke volume, which is the blood volume ejected over time. The relationship here is direct. The blood pressure is the peripheral blood pressure directly affected by the blood viscosity and the arterial diameter. All of this is dependent on the blood volume and the heart rate. Referring back to Frank's chart, here you can see a normal person's heart functioning with a healthy preload and stroke volume. This will equal good cardiac output. When the heart is injured and the preload is high, the greater the stretch, and therefore the greater the squeeze and resistance the heart must overcome to push the blood into the systemic circulation. So if the preload is high, the afterload will be high, and the cardiac output as well will be high. Okay, on the other hand, when the heart is injured, the preload will be low, the stroke volume will be low, and the cardiac output will be low as well. The lower cardiac output results in activation of one, the sympathetic nervous system, and it also results in two, decreased renal blood flow. So let's take a look at both of these. So first let's look at the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which activates the alpha and beta receptors by the decrease in cardiac output. The alpha and beta receptors are sensors located in the blood vessels. They sense the blood pressure and relay the information to the brain so that proper blood pressure can be maintained. So the alpha receptors equals constriction, which will bring more blood to the brain. And the beta receptors equal dilation, which will circulate blood to all of the organs. Here is an easy tool to help you remember this. Alpha constricts and beta dilates. 
Once the sympathetic nervous system is activated, it has three main effects. The first is activation of beta receptors. With activation of beta receptors, it increases the stroke volume and also the heart rate. This helps increase cardiac output for a while. However, eventually they cause damage to the heart, which can cause pulmonary congestion, hence left-sided heart failure. A tip to remember this is left-sided heart failure equals lungs. Just as a side note, this is why the medication beta blockers are given. These medications block the beta receptors. This slows down the heart rate and increases the stroke volume, ultimately stopping the damage from being done to the heart. The second effect of the sympathetic nervous system is the activation of alpha receptors. When the alpha receptors are activated, this leads to an increase in blood pressure from blood vessel constriction, which can also be thought of as afterload. This increase in afterload, also known as blood pressure, can further lower cardiac output. Just as a side note, this is why alpha blockers are given to block the constriction, thus inhibiting the elevation in blood pressure. The third effect that happens with the sympathetic nervous system is an increase in sodium retention, which then leads to fluid volume overload. When the fluid retention accumulates, it further worsens cardiac fusion, causing an increase in congestion, which equals cardiac toxicity due to the increase in oxygen demand from the body, hence right-sided heart failure and acute hemodynamic state as evidenced by all of these signs and symptoms. A tip to remember this is R equals the rest of the body. So now let's look at the effects of decreased renal perfusion to the kidneys. So when kidney perfusion is decreased caused by low cardiac output, this leads to an increase in aldosterone production. This increase in renin production leads to an increase in angiotensin 1, which will convert to angiotensin 2 with help of the ACE enzyme. The final effect of angiotensin II is a raise in the blood pressure or afterload, which can further decrease cardiac output, which may eventually lead to a further decrease in renal perfusion. The second effect of angiotensin II is an increase in aldosterone production, which leads to an increase in sodium and fluid retention, therefore causing decreased urine output. Urine output must be greater than 30 milliliters per hour in order to maintain adequate renal perfusion. Looking again at the Frank Starling's graph to understand that these changes due to preload and stroke volume in the setting of CHF. So remember, both the sympathetic activation and decreased renal perfusion, both of these lead to increased fluid retention. This eventually can lead to pulmonary congestion, which means backup of fluid in the lungs, and then further lead back up to fluid in other areas of the lungs because of an increase in stroke volume by an increase in preload. Let's break it down because this is important. An increase in stroke volume means too much fluid, and an increase in preload means that there's too much stretching, and the ventricles are being filled with too much fluid. In this condition, the heart can no longer pump enough oxygen-rich blood to the body, and is thus known as congestive heart failure.